you Jersey kids out there, this is True Jersey Kids. We're back again for this Friday episode. Uh, I am your host this evening for all the video game car crash things that happen uh, this evening. Alongside me is my best friend in the video game business, the best stick handler in the business, Gary Seisler. How you doing today, Gary? Excellent day, sir. I'm mean, doing doing very well. That's very good. very chill. <laughs> That's good. Uh, if you guys didn't know, if you're a new listener, we are a video game podcast. We release every Tuesday and Friday. This is the Friday episode where we give you all you know the news has been going on in the video game industry, and there's actually a, a, a decent amount that happened uh, this past week, which we're really excited to get into. Uh, I'm excited to get into. I'm sure Gary is as well. Um, and also, we have a Tuesday episode that we talk about. You know, uh, just a random topic. You guys can submit them. You can tweet us at Two Jersey Kids. You can email us Two Jersey Kids at gmail dot com. Um, and we'll, you know, we talk about specific random topics that are more personal uh, to how we feel about uh, video games in general. Uh, our last episode, episode thirty six and a half, was our favorite final levels and fa- favorite final bosses. And we went into some uh, COD and some Bloodborne. It was a fun time. Um, but yeah, that this is Two Jersey Kids video game podcast. It's a good time. If you're a new listener, you should stick around to the end. Uh, maybe you'll hit that subscribe button. Uh, maybe not. It's your call. Uh, but so, Gary, before we get into all the news, what have you been up to, my man? Well, not much video game related, unfortunately. This Me is too. how it usually Me seems. Too. This is how it's been going, honestly, for the past like few episodes. Let's be honest. But uh, I've been uh, actually kind of in the Star Wars vibe. So I went out and, and bought the prequel trilogy, if you can believe it, oh on Blu-ray. Oh my god, uh, do you want to now, try to murder yourself? Is that why <laughs> now, you bought okay. the prequels? Keep in mind, I'm trying to just fill out my uh, my Star Wars collection, so I guess it was about a year ago, I bought the original trilogy <laughs> on Blu-ray, so I, I kind of just wanted to fill it out. I you watching the prequels, like crying, eating ice cream, it's like, oh, I want KOTOR 3! <laughs> <Honestly, laughs> <I just, laughs> that's my picture. I, well, I mean, that's partially true but honestly though i i just wanted to like just sit back and watch the movies now for episode one i just finished last night and basically if i ignore everything with jar jar binks in it i can get past you know how bad that character is and how much i hate the character but um and, you know it's okay i i just it's okay to watch like darth maul it was worth seeing that encounter at least uh unfortunately now i have to go on to episode darth two maul which is my boy he's it could he could have been a good character but they They made him just irrelevant. But um, episode two, I'll be watching tonight, which, well, all bets are off. If I if I wasn't so hell bent now on not drinking as much as I used to, I'd probably be like, you know, the whole (laughs) six pack deep by like (laughs) midway through the movie. So (laughs) we'll see how how much of a slog episode two is. Uh, I was terrible. Oh, believe me. So I'll see. I will say this. I liked episode three. Okay, I said this before. It's the strongest one of the prequels. I actually look forward to seeing. I look forward to watching that movie because I like one more than, uh, but maybe I'm biased because I like I don't like Anakin. Like I feel like the less Anakin there is well, is better, and that's why I don't like the third one as much. Even though I mean, it has a great fight scene, they both have good fight scenes. Um, I just feel like it 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 has more to that movie. Like you just everything don't like matters. Number more. one, because you don't like Jar Jar, which granted Jar Jar sucks balls, <laughs> but yeah. yeah, he ruins the whole goddamn movie. I mean, he's terrible, and then. I, I hate to be this guy, but also Anakin, the uh, Jake Lloyd was also equally awful in that movie. Um, not not, not racing, necessarily his but... fault because oh yeah, pod racing. Not necessarily his fault. I think it's more of the writing on George Lucas's part. But uh, you know, I, I blame George Lucas for the uh, the mess that the, were the trilogies. But anyway, the, all the green screen that he had these characters just acting, trying to imagine all this shit happening. Instead of yeah, practical I, effects, which never seems like it works out nearly as uh, as much as you would like it to. Especially if they're – because I, I remember seeing, like, behind the scenes, it seemed like uh, these actors were just acting by themselves, like, not with anybody around them. Which, at least if you're acting CGI, which I, I think you had to do a lot, like, in Guardians of the Galaxy 2, but at least there was multiple people in the same shot so you're, you can placate off of each other instead of just being – like a green screen pretending to talk to some uh, flying character saying, Ani! Ah! Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I agree, man. That's got to be so weird. I, I don't know. I mean, the writing was, cl- I mean, the, uh, what do you call it? The script and the dialogue was really clunky in those movies, and obviously that didn't help anything. So that's pretty much been what I've been doing. Um, I'm actually going to post on Twitter later. I, I dug out some of my uh, old Lego Star Wars uh, things that I had laying Fucking around. Nerd. And I'm a- yeah, basically. And I, 
I basically put them on display in my game room. It looks pretty badass now, so I, I want to post some pictures on there. But that's honestly all I've been up to. Uh, nothing too crazy. Adam, what's been going on in your life? Um, kind of the same thing with not having a game to play. Uh, I haven't played the I haven't played NBA in the past week for some reason. It hasn't tickled my fancy, even though I've been watching the NBA Finals. Um, uh, I tried. Uh, I played Not Your Hero, which I mentioned, I think, in the last episode, which is like a, it seems like it, one of the games that would be perfect for Vita. You hop in, hop out, do quick levels, try to accomplish everything in the level. Um, so it's not really my type of game for sitting down on the PS4 to play. I also try to play uh, Swindle, which is a really cool concept if people are into this. Uh, I may keep checking it out uh, more. It's kind of like a steampunky vibe uh, where you're playing as like a thief, and after 100 days are up, you're trying to collect the most amount of money in the 100 days by robbing uh, these... I, I don't know what exactly they are. Uh, it's like these fortresses that are guarded by robots, basically. Um, and after 100 days are up, they ins- they're they installing a new surveillance system, which will make your uh, a profession obsolete, so you're trying to steal as much money as possible. And it's all kind of procedural generated. Like each day, you have a different level, and you try to collect money and then hack into certain systems. It's really cool. Uh, it's really... Uh, it- definitely got indie vibe to it it's very it can be very difficult um and i the one thing that's drawn me back with that game uh swindle is that it feel the controls don't feel as smooth as i want it to be it feels kind of clunky especially in like a 2d platformer type i want it to feel tight and especially if i'm trying to be precise with where i'm landing so i don't get attacked by the robots or set them off uh it can be kind of frustrating uh other than that i am waiting on for uh, review codes for a certain game that cannot be named at this very moment, which I'm excited about, but I hopefully, hopefully we'll get them soon. Uh, I reached out and contacted with them. They said they'll be in touch. Get, just be patient because uh, a good amount of, they had to get them out to a lot of people. And we're, we're still uh, low on the totem pole, so I'm sure we'll be last. Uh, <laughs> but I'm excited for that. Um, and then also I saw recently this week, it's sort of video game related. I saw the Blade Runner uh, 2049 trailer, which is really cool. Uh, sort of not rebooting. It's like a sequel to the original Blade Runner, which I remember uh, watching on Netflix. I thought it was uh, a cool vibe to it. I watched the theatrical version of it, which apparently is not as good as the director's cut, which it, it confuses me because there's multiple cuts of this movie um, and the director's cut later on apparently is like the better cut of the version uh, of the movie. But I saw the theatrical cut theatrical cut on netflix and i thought it was pretty good i really liked the uh the si- the setting that it was in the vibe it was like futuristic but yet still down to earth very gritty um had like uh what were they called basically just kind of ai units uh him investigating all of this and a lot of questions were still left to be answered and honestly the trailer made me think of uh cd project red's new uh project that they're working on and hopefully be out by like late 2019 uh cyberpunk 2077 which is supposed to be like set kind of like the blade runner style where it's like sci-fi but uh more down to earth i i hope anyway uh because it, it looks kind of cool with their concept art it looks like it's sci-fi but it still has like a uh, gun weapon so it kind of looks like a very gritty type uh look to it um I hope that they don't make it as dense as uh, The Witcher 3, which is one of my complaints with The Witcher 3. It's just too dense for me. I know a lot of people that just have that one game, that's probably uh, fantastic. But for me personally, it's a little that was a little too much. But, I mean, I already mentioned it on the 2JerseyKids.com when I wrote about episode 35 and a half. Is that Witcher 3, uh, that was one of the main reasons and also the fact that I couldn't connect. But that's neither here nor there. But I'm excited for uh, this kind of setting. Because I don't know if we've seen, besides... We have sort of seen it with uh, Deus Ex, that sort of kind of gritty vibe, but um, I, I'm excited to see what CD Projekt Red does with this new IP, um, and if they introduce a new cool character or uh, character um, that you can <laughs> take through this uh, world. What are you laughing character. at? Character. <laughs> character. Character. <laughs> you have any comments? It seemed like you were raising your hand while I was talking. Yeah, I mean... I, I always respected The Witcher for what, what they accomplished and the amount of support they gave the game, how they designed the game, and I thought it was a beautiful game all around. I just yeah. never personally got into it. I know, I'm crazy. Um, <laughs> but I hope this one, though, this futuristic sci-fi type of thing going on, I hope it, I hope it turns out well, because I love sci-fi, I love games yeah. that basically anything sci-fi related, I'm all about, so hopefully it's something I can look into in the future. 
It's like you're a Star Wars fan or something. Yeah, I mean, imagine that, right? Crazy. Uh, but now that we're done talking about us, let's get into the first segment of our, you know, uh, this whole Friday episode, which is this week in gaming history where Gary breaks down some of the games that were released way back when. And, you know, it is brought to you by Garrett Hayes when I do this, Gatorade, but not really because we're not sponsored by them, but I like to do it because it's, I don't know. Just cause it it's my it's because it's because it's, it's mildly amusing. But yeah, anyway, <laughs> um, there are only actually a couple games that I was able to find that were uh, interesting to me anyway. And honestly, there weren't really, like many too many big name titles out there. Strangely enough, but anyway, the first one that I found was actually Lego Pirates of the Caribbean, released on Nintendo Wii, 3DS, Xbox 360, PS3, PSP, and nintendo ds back in 2011 um i've always been a fan of the lego games i'd never played the uh, pirates of the caribbean ones but i did get a chance to play the uh shocking star wars ones and i thought <laughs> they did a re- they did a really good job with those back then because they didn't even have voice acting and i think that's changed since then yeah um, it was more like it was kind of all like um like a lot of physical comedy in those earlier versions of the games and they did a really good job so i always enjoyed them um the second game i have is actually Ri- uh, rise of nations rise of legends which was released on windows back in 2006 i remember this game exclusively because i uh was actually really pissed off that they never came out with a real sequel to rise of nations the original game which is more focused on like uh history like you would you basically it was um it was a real-time version of civilization so you would you know choose a a a nation and then build them up into the uh modern era i guess you could say and i just got i was kind of always annoyed because i thought rise of legends was kind of like just uh and i wasn't really interested in the mythology or the just like the the greek gods and all that stuff so i never really got into that too much Mm. um i'm not i'm not sure if you remember I mean, you remember Rise of Nations. We played that game. I remember game. Rise God, of Nations because we always played it over at uh, your grandparents' house. That's what I <laughs> Damn remember. Damn straight. That, and that we, game was we so always nice. get to, When we just we were tired of it, we would, at the end of the game, when we just wanted to start a new one, we would just get the codes to um, launch unlimited nukes and just start nuking yep. everybody. <laughs> and he, yeah, <laughs> we just basically create, set Armageddon off. Just Yeah, that timer. Oh, I always, I always love how uh, in those games, in like real time strategy, you have like these planes going up against like a uh, people with bow and arrows, and somehow they're taking <laughs> down planes. Like what? <laughs> that makes no sense. Remember, it's funny enough. Yeah, funny you mentioned that. There was actually a time where I think there was basically whenever you would advance an age in that game, all your units that you would have, like militarily, once you upgraded them. Every one of them would would upgrade, but like there were some, I guess, that couldn't be upgraded. They would just they were just specific to that era. Well, I remember I had like this one archer guy <laughs> who just like lived for thousands of years, and he just like he, I would bring him into battle, and he'd survive somehow going up against guys with guns. I was like, Jesus, dude, this guy's this guy's a legend. He purposely, but he eventually he purposely died, tried nice to sad. kill him, but he was basically Rambo. <laughs> yeah, it was yeah, it was a sad day when he perished in battle, but he lives on. In this podcast. Anyway, uh, that is actually it for this week in gaming. I hope to have more games to talk about next week, but uh, this one was kind of light. So, uh, Adam, you mention, uh, take the wheel. Mention Moby Games? Uh, yes, of course. Shout out to Moby Games once again for making this possible and doing all the work for me. Because, um, <laughs> you know, I'm lazy. Anyway, Adam, take the yeah. wheel. Give us the news for this week. There uh... if you, If there anything about Gary, you know he is lazy. I, for the other hand... Am not. Just kidding, Gary. You're awesome. Uh, moving <laughs> on to the articles this week. All the news has been going down. According to Jason Schreier over Kotaku, uh, he writes, Bioware Montreal has been scaled down and Mass Effect uh, has been put on ice for now. In the wake of Bioware's polarizing Mass Effect and Andromeda, fans have wondered where the lauded sci-fi series will go next. The answer, according to people familiar with the studio... Is nowhere, at least for the time being. Bioware has put Mass Effect on hiatus and turned Andromeda's developer Bioware Montreal into a support studio, according to four sources close to the company. That doesn't mean there will never be another Mass Effect game, of course. It's unlikely that Bioware will kill the popular sci-fi franchise, but Bioware is letting Mass Effect sit for a while rather than putting staff on Andromeda's follow-up right away, the sources said. 
Last month, a number of Bioware Montreal employees were transferred to the studio EA Motive, also based in Montreal, to work on Star Wars Battlefront 2. Those remaining at Bioware Montreal will help support Bioware's other games, including the new intellectual property codenamed Dylan, which we expect the company to announce at E3. Bioware Montreal will also continue to patch the... Su- patch and support Andromeda's multiplayer. Uh, Bioware's main studio in Edmonton is heading up Dylan while Bioware's other studio in Austin is also helping out other helping out with that game. Uh, when reached out for comment, publisher EA sent over the following statement attributed to Bioware Montreal studio director Yannick Roy, quote, Our teams at Bioware and across EA put tremendous effort bringing Mass Effect Andromeda to players all around the world. Even as Bioware continues to focus on Mass Effect Andromeda community and live service, we are constantly looking at how we're prepared for the next experience we will create. The teams at EA World Studios... Worldwide studios are packed with talent, and more than ever, we are driven collaboration between studios on key projects. With our Bioware and Motive teams sharing studio space in Montreal, we have Bioware team members joining Motive products that are underway. We're also ramping up teams on other Bioware projects in development. There will be much more to come from Bioware in the years ahead. Uh, Basically, that's uh, all that we really wanted to get into is uh, Montreal has been moved on back to their uh, support studio, uh, basically supporting roles, um, because this is the first time, if you didn't know, Gary, this is the first time Bioware Montreal got a first leading an actual game. Uh, This is their first crack at it. Um, And now... uh, and now they're back to the supportive role, and it kind of makes sense that they're uh, taking a step back because I think Mass Effect does need time to breathe after all of this, and uh, uh, and, and it, it is unfortunate because we were expecting maybe Mass Effect and Dramana would lead Snowball into more Mass Effect games, but after seeing what happened with this, uh, it makes sense taking a step back and uh, letting people breathe from this experience that happened. And not only that, but they can learn maybe look back and, and learn from some of the mistakes they made with Andromeda. And in turn, I mean, they could also create DLC in the future for the game or just maybe wait and just create a whole new Mass Effect down the line. So it gives them time to kind of just focus on maybe other projects that they're thinking about or maybe have on the table and kind of just, you know, let Mass Effect just sit back. Yeah, I mean, it's... Hey, I'm curious if they're actually going to release like meaty, like you know what, how Mass Effect always releases like meaty DLC. Yeah. Uh, I, I I think it was Mass Effect Two. I think that was like the wasn't that the one where you're trying to like be infiltrate somebody's uh, area and steal from them? I can't remember exactly. Ma- uh, it's Mass Effect while, Two, but oh, the DLC yeah. for that. I don't know yeah. if I ever played the DLC for Mass Effect Two. Did I? Actually, I think I may have. I. That's why. I th- yeah, yeah. Bioware was really. In- it wasn't that you had to go in and you, you had like that guy that was, uh, he was like kind of like being like, uh, I don't know how, how to, how to describe it, like possessed or something kind of like programmed by that. I can't, I can't Maybe. remember. Damn it. It's been so damn long. I have, <laughs> yeah, it was a good time. Yeah, it's been though. a while. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, but, uh, uh, let's, 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 let's move on. I think we shall. A study shows more people interested in buying Nintendo Switch than PS4 Pro. Hope Corgan over at IGN writes, A recent survey has revealed that more people are interested in owning a Nintendo Switch console than a PS4 Pro or an upcoming Microsoft Project Scorpio. The Nielsen Games 360 report uh, reports that from over a pool of 2,000 participants, 60, 16% of gamers aged 13 and up said they would probably buy the Switch, while only 15% said the same for PS4 Pro and 13% for the Scorpio. The report is a U.S. survey conducted yearly with the aims of researching how Americans are feeling about gaming and what products they are interested in. This trend held with the members of the general population as well, with 12% interested in Nintendo's latest console hybrid, 11% looking to buy Sony's improved PS4 model, and 9% interested in the upcoming Microsoft console. Nielsen's report does make a distinction between PS4 and PS4 Pro, as well as the Xbox One and and Scorpio, however, including the currently available consoles from Sony and Microsoft, dethrones Nintendo's lead. 21% of the gamer audience and 15% of the general public polled is interested in buying standard PS4 consoles, while the Xbox One is next in line with 17% and 12% interested from both groups, respectively. That puts the 
currently uh, currently available Xbox One and the Switch at an even level with the general audience. Uh, Nintendo's new console, uh, they go through how much it's sold. Uh, and also, the report also measured general awareness of all these platforms, noting that only 77% of gamers 13 and older said they have heard of PS4 versus 27% for the PS4 Pro, 72% for Xbox One, 29% for the Switch, and 14% for the Scorpio. Um, I think all of those are very fascinating numbers that people are still more interested in purchasing a PS4 or an Xbox One. And also kind of interesting that the fact that um, the, it's only 29% of uh, the general awareness out of the survey are are knowledgeable about the Switch in general. So I don't know if that's a marketing speak or, or it's just they haven't got their marketing out yet uh, for the, the Switch for everyone to learn about. Yeah. Um, I mean, so when I read this earlier, I I read this report and everything, and I I thought that 2,000 participants is kind of a small sample size. Call me crazy. But now that I'm reading more of this and I'm hearing all these numbers, it's kind of confusing me. Not not going to lie. But uh, (laughs) what was what's interesting numbers, Gary? uh, Well, all these percentages being thrown at my face is kind of fucking me up right now. But the um, the whole thing with the Nintendo Switch uh, having more of like uh or people being more interested in the switch are probably going to buy the switch i feel like especially especially more than like the ps4 pro which is like a step up it's not really a new console and yeah. the scorpio which they don't know about i feel like this this is sort of misleading maybe it's exactly. you know another case of i like to point it out everyone whacking off nintendo it seems like with the switch because here i'm get i'm gonna hop on the nintendo hate train right now i'm gonna be i'm gonna join you on this one gary because it frustrates me you know what frustrates me is that i see constantly each week it's posted by either Polygon or Nintendo or something. It's like, oh, a new game came to the Switch. Like, it's like a whole fucking yeah. crazy thing, even though it comes to <laughs> PS4 and Xbox One. And I feel like they're getting shafted, and they're making it more of a big deal that it's coming to the Switch. Like, I get it. People well, are excited it's about because the they have console so few and, games. Yeah, exactly. I, I, I get it. They're excited, and they want to play more things on the Switch because they like the hardware itself. But it, it's kind of frustrating that they're... It seems like they're, uh, I don't know if they're just trying to focus more on what's coming to the Switch, or there's not nearly as much, so they're sort of pointing out uh, games that are coming to it and making it a bigger deal than I think it should be. Well, not only that, and I completely agree with what you're saying, but not only that, but the whole thing is like, the Switch is a new console, and like you said, the PS4 Pro is just an upgraded version of the original PS4, therefore... The interest and the excitement isn't really going to be there because once you get the PS4 Pro, you're still playing the same games. Yeah. Now, granted, they're going to be you know graphically improved or the performance is going to be better. And the same, it's the, really the same thing with the Scorpio. So, and to be honest, we don't really know, I guess, too much about the yeah. Scorpio yet. We'll, we'll probably so, learn more in, uh, in in the coming months when E3 rolls around. Yeah. So this study is you know eh, kind of meaningless i mean 2000 people 2000 people that's like a kind of a joke but yeah. in my opinion um uh, so i don't know i would just you know just play the games you want play the consoles you want yeah and according to i think the same survey uh i'm not going to read the whole article but uh it's 64% of americans age 13 and older are gamers uh which if this is conducive to if they picked a wide enough swath of uh uh, polars, I guess you could say, uh, with from all walks of life. Then I guess sixty four, b- roughly sixty percent. Uh, I think it's showing that s- now gaming and mo- like, because you see Minecraft at the younger age and gaming is becoming more of a uh, coming into the mainstream audience and it's becoming less less of a uh, stigma, less of a negative connotation to it, which is a great thing for a lot of people and hopefully it'll expand the industry, bringing multiple people and experiences to the uh, the video game industry in its in of itself yeah absolutely and i also think that you know the reason why you see this nowadays is the fact that a lot of the game a lot of the games now i feel like are creative for a lot of different people you know before where you before in the old days i guess you could say you had like super mario and you had like doom and they were very specific games and i feel like they were very male oriented for the most part maybe not super mario but um you know, nowadays you have like games like The Last of Us and like games that can appeal to a wider variety of people because they can sympathize with the characters they see on the screen and they yeah. can kind of feel like they're part of a story. So it's interesting how because I remember 
not too long ago when we were, you know, kids, like when we were like, you know, 11, 12 or whatever, if you were, you know, like a person that played a lot of video games, people would look at you a different way and be like, oh, you know, you're a nerd, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. But, but now, like everybody plays video games, so it's not even a big deal anymore. I just find yeah. that very interesting. So I, I, do, <laughs> I do remember like every time they say, oh, what do you do for fun? And I would always be like nervous to say video games or write that down as my hobbies. And now it's becoming yep. more of a more of a thing where it's like completely fine to say that you like video games, um, which is really cool. Uh, but moving on uh, over at Kotaku, Jason Schreier writes, Prey shows that Bethesda's review policy is even bad for Bethesda. I found this actually a really fascinating article, and Jason Schreier, Kotaku, always does great actual video game journalism where he uh, cracks sort of uh, big things uh, for Kotaku, and uh, I'm excited to read this. Prey, the newest game from Arcane Studios, is, the most enjo- uh, is most enjoyable when you take your time exploring its corners and crevices. It's a quiet, unset- quite unset- it's quiet, unsettling game, one that can turn into a real drag if you try to rush. So why did Bethesda force review viewers to blaze through the game as quickly as possible, and what kind of lasting damage will this have? For the past years, much to the dismay of critics, Bethesda's marketing team has refused to send out early codes for their games. For Doom, Dishonored 2, and now Prey, Bethesda has provided review copies less than 24 hours in advance, giving reviewers little time to play through games before they launched. In a blog post last year about this decision, Bethesda offered a laughable justification, writing, quote, while we will continue to work with media, streamers, and YouTubers to support their coverage, both before and after release, we want everyone, including those in the media, to experience our games at the same time, end quote. Uh, he writes in parentheses, it's worth noting that Bethesda has blacklisted Kotaku for three and a half years now, and while, of course, we have continued to cover the publisher's games fairly and honestly, this particular policy has no effect on us, and so Bethesda did not respond to a request for comments on this article. He continues, This is a strange, disdainful decision was slammed by cr- critics when Bethesda announced it last fall, but the publisher has maintained its policy nonetheless. This makes Bethesda an anomaly. Traditionally, game publishers will send out review copies to the press one to two weeks in advance, often with a, quote, review embargo, end quote, of a specific time and date on which critics can post their thoughts. This allows everyone to stay on the same page. A critic at IGN doesn't have to worry about being scooped by a critic at Game Snacks Weekly because they have both agreed to the same embargo. I'm curious if Game Snacks Weekly is an actual thing. I kind of want to check it out. The time frame may be tight depending when review copies hit, but nobody has to rush to be the first on the web. Yesterday, for example, we received a copy of Fire Emblem Echoes from Nintendo, giving us a solid 11 days to play through the game before it comes out on May 19th. Atlas, God bless them, sent the codes for Persona 5 nearly two months before it launched. Although publishers like Activision haven't typically offered early review or access to online-only games like Destiny, and once in a while a publisher will send out codes late, those are extraordinary cases. Most publishers are happy to give out codes for their single-player games, with rare exceptions. With Prey, as with la- the last two Bethesda games, the landscape is different. Nobody received the, ga- received the game until May 4th, the day Prey launched. IGN Game Snacks Weekly would again be on the same page. But here, there was no embargo. Whoever blazed through the game and wrote his or her, her review first would get all of that sweet, sweet traffic from from algorithm-heavy websites like Google and Facebook that reward speed over quality. Although many reviewers, including IGN and Kotaku's, have taken their time with the game in hopes of writing in-depth critiques, others did not. Prey reviewers were popping up as early as May 5th, despite the lack of early code. Some of these early Prey reviews have been positive, others have been harsh. I'll leave it to the readers to decide which reviews are worth reading, but there's one outlet that adds a great deal of significance to this dilemma, Metacritic, a website that aggregates reviews and spits out a nice big number for everyone to look at. As we've reported extensively, Metacritic has a huge impact on the video game industry. Game game developers' bonuses are sometimes tied to Metacritic scores, and publishers like to ask for a studio's previous score before or deciding whether to greenlight a pitch. Often, developers will put their game's meta scores on resumes and job applications. Despite Metacritic's many problems and the arbitrary, meaningless nature of review scores in general, the number still carries weight in the video game industry. As of May 9th, Prey has an 80 Metacritic, although that number may jump up and down a bit before it settles, it is not considered fantastic. Uh, he writes in parentheses, From what I've heard anecdotally, most publishers' Metacritic bonuses require games to hit an 85 or 90. I don't know if Prey has any such bonus. The Metacritic store is based entirely on thoughts of critics who have go- had the game for four or five days. The 
this boggles the mind, doesn't it? Arcane Austin started developing Prey in May 2013, nearly four years ago. Reviewers have offered thoughts and scores contributing to a big number that will hang on Arcane for the rest of the studio's existence after the playing of the game for less than a week. Those reviewers cranked through the game under suboptimal conditions, rushing to beat the clock and the competition, despite the fact that most Prey players will have far different experiences. Uh, he writes, I don't envy anyone who had to review Prey. It's certainly not pleasant to have to beat a video game and then write up a coherent, interesting thought thoughts under such a brutal time constraint and i certainly don't begrudge website for publishing reviews in a timely fashion as possible nor would i ever say that one reviewer's opinion is less valid than others but still i can't help but wonder how that metacritic number would look if bethesda had given reviewers proper time had proper lead time with prey i spent the past few days playing this game soaking in the atmosphere sneaking around to read emails and hunt down side quests if i had to rush to finish it for a review, I'd be stressing out every time I ran out of ammo or failed to take down one of those damn fire phantoms. Maybe I switched to easy or try to cheese uh, the game just to finish it. Uh, he's enjoying the game to, uh, constraint or enjoying the game so far. He continues to write uh, Bethesda f- failures uh, to give re- Bethesda's failure to give reviewers the same opportunity does a disservice not just to the customers who won't get timely reviews from their favorite critics, but to the developers at Arcane who spent four years on this game only to watch reviewers stamp numbers on it after just four days. There's no way to know whether play review play reviewers would have felt differently if they weren't rushed, but regardless, Bethesda's policy is a bummer for everyone, even Bethesda. Whoo, that was a long article, but I felt like it was worth reading all of it, uh, in my opinion. Uh, I think it offered a lot of interesting tidbits and knowledge, uh, but I want to just, uh, you know, get your thoughts first, Gary. Um, yeah, I, I've been thinking about the reasons for why Bethesda would actually do something like this, and I've heard, I've been reading some of the comments, what people are saying, and like they're saying how Bethesda wants to be able to control the, their marketing and be able to keep people's pre-orders without, like, by basically avoiding the negative press if someone wrote a bad review about them. You know, I totally understand that, but at the same time, I don't, because I feel like this sort of situation really sucks for the consumer, because... As as a, you know, a consumer that wants to sit back and you know read a review, a honest review about a game, and maybe you know take time to think about buying it and everything, I just feel like not not being able to see something, or not being able to re- not being able to read a review that's been you know like thoughtfully written and you know, pe- the person's actually had the time to play the game. I just feel like it hurts the consumer, and ultimately, I, I don't see how you make uh, your customers happy by doing this. You know. Yeah, and it doesn't make sense to me. Um, it also it affects Bethesda developers themselves. I didn't realize that Metacritic has such an impact on some, uh, like the developers' bonuses that they get. I don't know after the game is released, especially if they put four years into this game just to have it uh, based on when reviewers have it. Or it makes sense because sometimes reviewers want to get those clicks, especially if they're if they're smaller uh, websites. They want to get the traffic to their websites and hopefully grow. Um, and I, I mean, I, I stand in the opinion that I don't think, uh, review scores really show all too much. Uh, I feel like if you want to know what the game is about, you should actually read the review in itself. Uh, but review scores I think are here and they probably will stay. Um, and also the fact that, uh, developers do use when they are applying to new positions, they use Metacritic scores on their resume, which is fascinating, uh, that how this review structure does have an impact on the industry in of itself whether if it's not just the consumers or the media it's also the developers themselves by the way um if you remember we actually covered this yeah. back in the day you know back in the back day, like in the maybe, day. Pro- <laughs> probably a few months 12 ago. 12 years ago when we were 11 years old <laughs> jesus i hope not that'd be a terrible terrible podcast but um i don't know we're pretty good <laughs> i yeah, you're probably right. Yeah, yeah. we could we could have pulled it off. I think it's well. Anyway, so. um, I, I think that it's interesting because we criticized this back then. Obviously, a lot of people were at the same time, but now you see the results of that decision hurting them, hurting the actual company that made that decision. You know, like you have these reviewers going blowing through their game. They give them like you know, you know, better than average scores. Mm-hmm. But what happens if the game was a really good game? All it took was just time to play through it. You know, you just never yeah. know. But unfortunately, it's not really. It, it, this is what it comes down with, like you have like a large corporation over 
uh, these developers. It's the publishing oh, yeah. aspect of Bethesda that is making these decisions. It's not the game developers. This is what you see all the time with big corporations making large decisions for their bottom dollar, but then uh, just taking away benefits for the employees of themselves, not really considering them. They just want to make uh, the maximized profit out of it, and if they can, re- if they want to release later on, and they see that they get slightly better profits, I'm sure they'll go that route, even though it can hurt their actual employees that are developing these games that they are publishing which is a shame it's a real shame very 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 true uh, unfortunate yeah it is unfortunate moving on um apparently uh square enix is trying to sell off uh io interactive um the makers behind the latest hitman uh over uh, i saw an article on your gamer um, but they, Square Enix made a statement, quote, To maximize player satisfaction as well as market potential going forward, we are focusing on our res- resources and energies on key franchises and studios. As a result, the company has regrettably decided to withdraw from the business of IO Interactive as AS, a wholly subsidiary, subsidiary and a Danish corporation as of March 31st, uh, 2017. So first, I wanted to say... Good luck to everyone that's in IO Interactive uh, finding a job or a game to, a project to work on. Uh, I'm sure you'll land on your feet because I'm hearing great things all the time about Hitman, the episodic, uh, the game that they created. A lot of people really enjoy that game. And also, I feel like that's one of their better selling, funny enough, Square Enix, one of their better selling uh, uh, IPs that they owned. Um, so it's kind of fascinating that they're letting go a studio that actually produced a pretty solid game. Um, so, uh, but also, uh, it, it is, it comes also that apparently Square Enix, uh, reported huge sales and profits. So, uh, I guess from Final Fantasy 15, um, Hitman, uh, Rise of the Tomb Raider, all of these, uh, projects that are releasing, um, and yeah, so... Over at well, your gamer Wesley Yin Pool uh, writes for the fin- financial uh, year ending March 31st, Square Enix saw net sales of 1.7 billion pounds, an increase of 20 percent versus the previous year. The previous year with operating income up 20.3 percent and ordinary income up 22.9 percent. Um, so yeah. It's kind of interesting that they're letting go studio even though they're up sales-wise and profit-wise. I mean, unless they – is it possible that the Hitman series, they feel like they won't be able to continue getting that same profit from that series? Like it's not as marketable maybe? I mean I'm just throwing things out there at this point. I mean but... I, I feel like they're about to release Volume 2, which would have uh, um, you know, probably sold just as much because people have been hearing uh, great things – um no did you did you play the recent hitman game i know you're no i really wanted to um i'm probably waiting until it uh comes out and it the sale price is reduced um but yeah i mean that's really my thoughts on squares (laughs) sales and and everything um it kind of makes sense because final fantasy 15 finally came out and i'm that did well i think it sold over a million copies uh and you have uh, plenty of other titles that they released this week like rise of the tomb raider which is a, a large uh, game. Uh, Gary, can you do me a favor and read this next article? Putting you on the spot. Sure thing. So, this next one is talking about basically online sales and how they've been increasing over the uh, past few years. So, the article title is EA reckons 40% of console game sales will be downloads by the end of 2017. Now, this is from Eurogamer.net, written by Wesley Yin Pool. It's no secret the video game industry is trending towards digital, with an increasing percentage of console game sales coming from downloads each year. But for EA, that trend is moving faster than it predicted. In a financial call last night, EA predicted the f- industry will end 2017 probably above 40% for full game downloads. If correct, it means we're hurtling towards that magical 50% milestone. The debate about whether to go physical or download when it comes to buying a game is a long-running one. Buying a disc means you can trade it in or sell it, or sell it on. Interesting. <laughs> typically, buy, typically, buying a disc is cheaper than downloading a full, game, uh, full console game, too, with often prohibitive prices on the Xbox and PlayStation stores. But clearly, more and more people are going with downloads, despite these issues. If you've got a fast internet connection, it's pretty convenient, after all. Um, so personally, I, I know that I actually, in the past, have always been about the physical owning a physical copy of the game, like actually going to the store, having a, having the game box and being able to look through the game and everything. I just always liked that. But 
I will say that nowadays, like, I don't know, I've actually gotten more into buying online because I just think mm. it's convenience. And at the same time, like, if I can just now, have do it you, instantly. Or, now, do you buy, purchase it online? Because I, I think you always mentioned you purchase it Amazon, but you still get it physically. Or are you actually purchasing it, online and getting it digitally more often now? So, okay, so I have done it. Um, I think with No Man's Sky, yeah, No Man's Sky I bought, and I got that physical, like a physical copy of that. Now, that's more expensive than going to the store, I believe, because of shipping. But um, what I did was, I think, what game was it that I bought? Did, it might have been Horizon, Horizon Zero Dawn, I think. Or no, Yeah, it was. Um, I bought that game on Amazon. I bought the, the digital key, mm-hmm. and it was basically the same price as, as like going to GameStop, for example. So mm-hmm. I, I didn't really necessarily save money but at the same time i had it immediately you know you save money basically through travel or whatever you have to do to get the game itself so yeah i personally like buying uh games online now i don't know i just find it convenient and it's easy i don't have to keep hopping a disc in and out you know i sound lazy as hell but it, <laughs> it, it does help honestly i mean it's it's annoying chasing discs all the time yeah uh, yeah uh, i've i've gone that route way back when before any of this before i think it was ps3 days where i was still uh purchasing things digitally um and downloading to my hard drive just because it made things a lot easier especially if it's easier to get it there instead of you know at a game store like if you're easy if you're able to pre-order it ahead of time on your console and then all of a sudden it downloads the, the day or that night or the day before, and then it pops up right at the midnight mark. I mean, that makes it all the better instead of you have to go out, wait in line for the physical copy, get it, bring it back, yeah. plug it in, install it, you know, the whole nine yards that go into... Uh, yeah, and in that case, too, like if you go out and buy the physical copy, you always have to deal with the possibility of the store being sold out as well which has happened uh many times to me in my life so were you trying to find a nintendo the- switch game oh <laughs> no. shit shots fired motherfuckers damn son <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. um but yeah <laughs> yeah i just think this is the route that <coughs> sorry this is the route that's gonna go um I think yelling sort of fucked up my throat. I'm shocking. I'm shocked the monitor thing didn't pop up saying, "Shut up, you bastard! Stop screaming into the mic." Um, but uh, yeah, I, I'm sh- I'm sure it'll continue this route once Wi-Fi keeps getting better and better, uh, faster and faster internet connections. And I'm sure uh, sooner or later, I feel like the bottom will drop out for physical r- releases, um, and it'll become a way more of a niche thing or niche, as people like to say. Um, and you, I feel like that will lower the price of games in general because you don't ha- won't have the middleman of like the publisher or like the manufacturing of the CDs or cartridges, and uh, it'll soon start creeping down slower and slower um, because of competition. Like I would like to see like EA say is like, oh, well we release our games for fifty dollars now, or then Ubisoft yeah, I, is like, <laughs> let me release it for forty five dollars now, trying to reduce I'd the lo- margin. I would love to see that. That'd be I would great. love it. Uh, just, e- yeah, I would love to see EA do anything like that ever in my lifetime. Will it happen? Maybe not. I m- probably could probably not. bet money and it will never happen, but you know. Uh, moving on to our basically rumor section of the podcast. There's been a lot of rumors dropping this week uh, over a video game 24-7. First one being the next Far Cry game to have a Wild West setting out in September, according to a rumor. Uh, who writes it? Sharif Saeed writes, The setting of Far Cry 5, or whatever the next Far Cry game ends up being called, has apparently leaked online in the most unconventional way. Great Falls Tribune reported about a film crew shooting a live-action trailer for an unannounced game near a church in Montana Prairie. Jeff Gullett, a producer on the shoot, revealed to the paper that this is for the game to be released in September. Gait... Gait also said that the production, quote, stretched more than 5,000 miles from California to Montana, end quote, and the game in question is a, quote, sequel to an existing global franchise, end quote. This all indicates the trailer for a spaghetti western game, or at least a game set in the 19th century America. Everyone immediately assumed this was for Red Dead Redemption 2. Uh... It's the only game with a Western setting in the development we know of, after all. However, producer Jeff Geet worked with Ubisoft before on, before on promo campaigns for Driver, Red Steel 2, and Rabbids. So it's very likely these trailers is being made for a Ubisoft game. The more obvious franchise here is Far Cry. Early in 2015, Ubisoft polled players about several possible settings it could use for the next Far Cry game. Quote, a game in a spaghetti western style set in the 19th century Americas, end quote, was one of the 
one of those choices. Ubisoft previously used live action trailers to promote his game before. Uh, I thought it was really fascinating. Uh, I'm going to get your thoughts on it in a second. Um, but Jason Schreier over Kotaku did tweet out uh, that there was, quote, a lot of bad reporting about this, about... Uh, about out there about the next Far Cry, uh, I have not heard anything about it being a Western, just that it's set in Montana, end quote. Uh, so, Gary, let me get your thoughts about the setting and maybe it being a, a Western sort of maybe competing with Red Dead Redemption 2, which is a fascinating uh, thing that will happen. Well, first of all, I would love the Wild West setting. I'm going to put that out there right now. I love that 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 time period. I love that setting. It's awesome. Um It'd be interesting to see them go against Red Dead. With that said, I, I don't know. Maybe it's like he's saying that it's kind of just a rumor at this point. The Wild West thing might not happen, but if it is in Montana and they're going for like that kind of uh, like forest type vibe, it would really be interesting to see how they can make that happen because yeah. they could really go a lot of different ways with that. I feel like if after all Far Cry, you're usually lost somewhere or you're mm-hmm. you end up in a really bad position. They could really make that game really creepy, like a like a deep forest you're being like you know chased down by some crazy maniac i mean that could be really awesome and i Classic even if it isn't game. a wild yeah exactly and, and even if it isn't like a um like a wild west theme i think it could be really good um what's that movie called the uh damn it of course i can't remember it right now john voight's in it it's like that crazy backwoods hold on i'm looking it up right now okay do you want me to go yeah, with my thoughts it. um so i mean i kind of get I understand where uh, VG twenty four seven. Deliverance. Up oh, there we go. I understand. I apologize. <laughs> I understand. Damn it, Gary. I understand where they're getting the Western setting because it was in a survey about the next Far Cry. It does sort of make sense that a Wild West, if it's set in the nineteenth century, like in well, I don't know if it's set in the nineteenth century, but if it's set in Montana, it would be kind of strange to do a modern day. A setting with Montana with normal guns and like a bow and arrow sniper rifles. I'm not sure how they would work that out in uh, the U.S. of A. Uh, maybe it'll be you're uh, stuck in like a park somewhere um, getting hunted down and it's sort of just so open that and Montana is so empty sometimes that you just don't, no one knows about what's going on. Maybe, um, but I feel like the Western setting would be a better choice for this, and I feel like it'd be actually really cool. You, know, you could still have the bow and arrow because bow and arrows w- uh, went back way back when, which I always loved using bow and arrow in uh, Far Cry games. But you then it'd be cool like the different weapons that they could use, like a repeater, a revolver, um, all those uh, all those different types. Uh, it would just be a, d- a different take on Far Cry and uh, have a new setting, which would be rather cool in my opinion yeah i honestly it's it's a win-win either way i'm actually even like i said even if it isn't a western theme i like the idea that it's set in montana there's just so many interesting ways they could take it so i'm really excited about this i'm sure there's gonna be some crazy motherfucker after you i'm sure that i'll hell yes hopefully they they can uh, channel uh, what they did in far cry 3 with voss make him that crazy and that fucking annoying but in a good way yeah in a good way that was the problem with Far Cry 4, man. I, the, the villain just wasn't... I, I couldn't hate him, really. Like He was a dick, but I couldn't hate him. Yeah, he didn't was... He didn't provide like that sort of anger that Voss did that it was always like one step ahead, uh, and he just... Very oh, cocky. Yeah, cocky motherfucker. Oh, so glad when I finally killed him in a psychedelic state. Uh, spoilers! <laughs> uh, moving on to the next rumor. The new Assassin's Creed is, quote-unquote, huge like Skyrim purported screen grabs leaks uh <laughs> uh over uh, uh, there it is shaban shabana arif over video game 24 7 Rumors about the next Assassin's Creed games have been swirling about during the series' much-needed break. The latest one is suggesting that it'll go down the syndicate route with a pair of male and female protagonists. Thus far, we've heard that the project title is Assassin's Creed Empire, and that the setting for the game will be Egypt. WWG claims to have spoken to sources at Ubisoft who have confirmed that the next game will be revealed at E3 in a few weeks, which sort of makes sense, and and that the new title is Assassin's Creed Origin. Apparently the game is, quote, a vast open world experience, and quote, set in Egypt, telling telling the tale of the original Assassin's Guild. Character progression won't be intertwined with the story of the same extent as previous titles in the series, with one of the sources going so far as to compare it to Skyrim. Players can 
even venture beyond the bounds of Egypt, quote, possibly even as far as Greece, end quote, says WWG. The freedom and exploration sound like a far cry from the usual fare of the franchise. Another source told WWG that Assassin's Creed Origin is the game will be quote unquote huge and the biggest Assassin's Creed Assassin's Creed game created. Whoo! Bates boats <laughs> Jesus boats and naval combat are also purported to be a part of the gameplay, as you can see in the image posted uh, from a Reddit thread. Uh, the guy manning the boat also looks similar to the purported leaked screenshot of the game in February. Uh, you can zoom in, uh, E3, blah, 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 blah. Uh, it's really fascinating that they're going to go the m- larger open world route like Skyrim. But the main thing, the main thing as I slam my desk, that they need to address in these new Assassin's Creed game, if they come out... And they release basically the same cookie cutter Assassin's Creed bullshit, just in a different area, not changing the ge- way the game plays, not changing the way you feel and move, not changing the way uh, like the button layouts are, or the combat is, or updating the combat that is. Uh, like if they, uh, one major thing is if they don't add like a crouch feature, if they don't make it an actual stealth game, which is like being an assassin is what it's supposed to be. You crouching around, you actually stealthing, making it feel like a, a stealth game instead of you just walking in, like, crowds, not really being stealthy, running on rooftops. Um, if they just, if it's just the same cookie cutter bullshit that is the original, the other Assassin's Creed games, I'm not going to be interested in it. And I feel like a lot of other people won't be interested interested in this because, I mean, uh, this is just the same old, same old, why, why wait? a few years to finally release the game unless you just wanted to wait so you don't have those break code uh bug breaking parts of the game i mean what is the point in my opinion i completely agree with you and i also think that i i don't know about you but personally i'm starting to get tired now of all these games kind of trying to shift over to that open world now i I know like assassin's creed already has kind of an open world but um i just I f- I'm getting tired now of like a lot of these games going to these gigantic worlds, and sometimes they just don't have enough going on to justify yeah. why they made a world so big. Like now, this is something Ma- Mafia call Three. Me, call me- Mafia Three is a good example of that. That they made the world too large, and it felt really empty. Even though if it was set in like a linear, smaller open world, it's just a linear storyline with a. Uh, small side missions that actually felt like legitimate missions then it would be a fantastic game but they made the world too large it felt really empty felt like you were doing the same old same old um and i want to actually play off that because i have something to say about horizon now i loved horizon and i liked pretty much everything about the game but i also think that the game could survive even if if, if it was a smaller world yeah, that's true. if it was more more linear mission structure because i thought the story was tremendous and i thought mm-hmm. that that was one thing i I, I loved about that game. I wish that the story went on longer than it did. Um, and I'm so sure, I just, I, I'm sure they did when they were doing Horizon. I wonder if they did think about putting in a linear story where it's more of just like more each level. It's kind of like the Uncharted uh, area where it's just more expansive, yeah. but in a linear setting where you can go explore like less of a style, go explore little caveats of the world in itself, and move linearly through the story. Um, but I do, I did enjoy the open world aspect of it, where uh, the side managed, side mission, some of the side quests felt like it was sort of go collect this, but some felt like legitimate. Um, so uh, I want, like I've said, I'm sure they'll build off of that, but not, I'll stop talking so you can continue, Gary. No, I mean I completely agree. I, I think I just hope that, like you were saying, you know, Assassin's Creed obviously needs um, a lot of major changes, you know, with how the game performs and the gameplay mechanics and all that stuff, but. I just hope that they aren't trying to now, you know, go off into this open world thing and, and expect that that's just going to kind of like make everybody want to flock back to Assassin's Creed. I hope they take their time and the open world that they create is worth actually exploring and not just like a like a no man's sky sort of thing where you have tons of spots to explore but not a lot to really do. You know, and that yeah. doesn't that doesn't work out in the end, obviously. Hmm. Uh, uh. Yeah. Because most of the Assassin's Creed world. Uh. It felt kind of like it was an open world type 
deal from what I remember playing the game because it's been so long. Um, but it felt more of like a linear story because you only had to go do certain things um, moving forward. And uh, I don't know, it just felt like you were progressing in one singular direction instead of just going around doing unnecessarily unnecessary side quests. So we'll see how they, they cope with this. Let's see if uh, they actually change what people probably have been crying out for them to change. Uh, you know, let's not release the game with a bunch of bugs and fucking scary bugs that make people look just like floating eyeballs. Um, but <laughs> moving on, uh, continue with the video game 24, uh, video game 24 seven, uh, trend that we got going. Brenna Miller over Brenda, Brenna Hiller over at video game 24 seven writes an overwatch league team franchise will cost you 20 million. Uh, whisper says it was originally a rumor and then a blizzard responds. So I'll get the, you know, plug, put that in there. She writes, Overwatch could be a great esports game if Activision Blizzard ever gets its act together, but some hot new intel goes some way towards explaining just why established organizations haven't pl- flocked to its banner. According to anonymous sources speaking to ESPN, Blizzard is asking for a whopping $20 million, $20 million franchise fee to buy, buy into the Overwatch League. And that's just the minimum price. Bigger markets like New York and L.A. are looking to, looking at footing an even larger bill. That may not seem much in comparison with traditional sports leagues like the NBA or MLB, but it's higher than competing products. League of Legends, probably the most successful Western esports scene, offers team franchises for $1.8 million. Moreover, the report claims Overwatch League won't guarantee revenue sharing until after 20. 21, and even then, only if Blizzard hits its financial targets, which were not disclosed. Overwatch League is supposed to launch later this year, but sources said they doubt it will happen. Several major teams have dropped out of negotiation recently, and sources said they expect even more to follow suit. We can only hope that Blizzard's new esports division will bring MLB's experts to the table and sort all this out. Um, she continues, blah, 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 blah. Apparently Blizzard had respond, had responded to ESPN's report on Overwatch League with a lengthy statement issued to GameSpot. A uh, representative for the studio did not directly address the detail of the report, but said, quote, enthusiasm, end quote, for the Overwatch League has resulted in, quote, unverified and widely ranging rumors from anonymous sources about perpetu- uh, purported uh, deal terms, team pricing, and other details, end quote. Uh, Blizzard said it won't release information regarding the Overwatch League until it is, quote, at a place where it makes sense to do so, end quote. Uh, honestly, if they're charging $20 million to start a team franchise for esports, that's fucking nuts. But that sounds kind of like Activision trying to wring out all the money it possibly can. <laughs> yeah. That just, um, that's all I can really offer to this. I, I Yeah, I kind of feel like if you're trying to, you know, create a new league or something like that, you might want to not ask that kind of price just kind of yeah. throwing it out there but yeah like you said activision they just try to steal everybody's money and they <sighs> do because people just yeah. continue to basically feed their greed like you answers. gary with destiny yeah I you, guess just so. ins- you just insulted yourself <laughs> gotcha motherfucker uh, not as smart as you think <laughs> no I don't know about that. It's debatable. <laughs> uh, moving on. I'm not really going to read the title. Uh, the title. I'm not going to really read the article because it just goes into the impressions of somebody playing uh, a certain game. But it actually kind of made me excited. Uh, apparently, Divinity Original Sins 2 uh, has a Game Master mode, uh, which reading through it kind of sounded really fascinating where you can uh, have a bunch of maps uh, uh, map drawings, multiple choice vignettes, uh, apparently that you can, being the game master, you can implement, you can have, uh, certain dice rolls to see what happens. Um, it just makes me, uh, they have, like, pictures of it. It, it kind of excites me because one, individual Original Sin, the original game, apparently was a really good kind of Diablo-style game, and it's kind of cool that they're introducing, like, the D&D aspect, uh, to this game because there's not many games like this out there there is uh oh shit i forget what it's called uh oh well i'll figure it out later on and i probably won't remember by the end of this podcast but uh, there's only one more other like D style based game but it's kind of cool if they're 
they, it seems like they're offering a lot of choices, allowing you to roll dice, a lot of things that you can create as the game master, uh, have different enemy types in the game, um, d- uh, different characters that people can create, and um, I'm not sure if it'll take off. I, I hope it does, because D&D is, I fucking love watching people play d and I would love to be part of a and d campaign with like a legitimate DM who does um, like intricate storytelling and all that, and I feel like this provides a good avenue for that style of play because you can actually visually see what's going on uh you can have uh if if you get enough people together and you talk uh have voice chat and have the conversations um i mean i feel like it could be conducive to running your own D campaign um i'm not sure if they'll maybe in the future if they'll add more and more things that you can use to create maybe i'm not entirely sure if you can create everything uh, or if it's just like a cookie cutter type world where you sort of plop people in. Um, but it's really fascinating, in my opinion. Um, D&D, A+. Plus. So, uh, good on them for adding this mode to it. Uh, it's definitely, we'll see if it takes off. If not, um, that's kind of going to be a little unfortunate. But, I mean, it kind of makes sense. Yeah, I uh, I mean, I'm not really familiar with these sorts of games. It's not something I'm really too crazy about. But uh, I like the fact that you have so many, op- like, you were writing actually in this Google Doc, that there's just seems to be a lot of options and, and different things uh, or different ways that you can play this game. And I think that's yeah. just a really cool aspect, something unique to this game. And that's what makes D&D kind of fun when you play with friends is that it allows you to do different choices and it's sort of like improv. So the DM can just, based on what you decide, you can go out of a completely left field of what your decision is and it takes you down a completely different path. Um, as a character, you progress, gain experience, basically like a video game. Um, but instead of it being like a linear story or one story that's being told, uh, it's sort of like a story you guys, uh, everyone as a party, and the dungeon master or game master sort of create together. And that's why I, I like D&D, um, because you can tell very interesting stories. Um, so, yeah. I mean, I just wanted to put that in the, at the end because I thought it was kind of cool that they added that. Didn't expect that uh, from the second... Uh, uh, second, 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 second license, license, second game in this franchise. What is the word I'm looking for? I can't remember, but you know, that's the end of the the articles for this week. There was a lot of stuff, Gary. It was pretty good. I feel like it was pretty good, pretty good, pretty good. We had some technical yeah. difficulties in the middle. I'm not sure if anybody probably can c- catch it, but uh, we had some technical difficulties because of the stupid Skype sort of lagging on us. But uh, but before we do go, uh, Gary, do you want to say anything, what you're going to be doing uh, this upcoming weekend? Any thoughts, you know, want to get out there? Um, uh, nothing too crazy. I mean, I'm going out tomorrow night and kind of having Ooh, a good time. It's nice, nice, to get out of the ha- <laughs> nice to get out of the house. You know the deal. Don't get too um, trash, Gary. I'll try not. Well, actually, no, I I won't be because I am keeping my drinking in check. Nice. Sounds bad. It are sounds you, bad, guys, but I'm actually. Are you the it's, DD? It's fitness. No, no. Uh, um, where I, it's actually a, <laughs> we're actually taking a party bus over. It's kind of cool. Oh, uh, party! <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, you know, just going to be hanging out this weekend, uh, chilling. Um, but. Other than that, though, just the usual, you know, usual stuff. Uh, thanks for listening. We appreciate every listen. You know, check us out on iTunes. See when you get the chance, give us that review. Um, but thanks for being here, guys. Uh, I'll see you again on. Is it Tuesday or is that the interview? I'm not sure if we're putting I that think, in there or I, not. We, I think we'll probably be putting that in there. Um, okay. But yeah, uh, this Friday, right. uh, yeah, this Friday I'll be interviewing somebody. Uh, I forget. Uh, I don't think he's giving me his name, so I have to get that before the interview starts, but. Uh, it'll be fascinating. I don't really want to mention what the title is yet because I don't know yet, but, um, I'm excited. Um, yeah. Uh, and also go check out, go to two jerseykids.com and check the little blurb that Gary wrote about, uh, episode 36 and a half. He did a good job Yeah. talking about Damn why, right. why he wants more, uh, Star Wars games. Obviously that is his first post that he decided to do about <laughs> Star Wars. Uh, that's, that took the easy way out. Yeah. yeah. It's Gary. Um, but yeah, thank you guys so much, uh, for listening um we greatly appreciate it um again if you're a new listener thank you for sticking with us this whole hour or so sometimes i know it can be a slog even ah, actually it's not a slog because we're fucking amazing why would you feel like it's a slog when you have me and gary talking to you let's be real we're amazing and if you think we're amazing which i know i'm in your brain right now i know you think we're amazing go go rate us on the podcast app service that you use if there's a rating system uh if not there's not a rating system then just share it with your friends 
well, or do both. Uh, if you're on an Apple device, can you please go to the podcast app and rate us on iTunes? It'd be fantastic. That would help us out greatly. Um, if you can rate us on Stitcher, we are available in a lot of places. Stitcher, TuneIn, SoundCloud. Um, but SoundCloud, we sort of only have like two episodes up just due to uh, storage constraints. Um, iTunes, Overcast, a lot of different places uh, we are available. And, uh, yeah, we appreciate all you guys' listeners. Listen, them all, we appreciate you all. That's basically what I wanted to say. Gary, say bye before I freak Adios. out. Adios. Before I bug out and just have, like, a meltdown. All right, guys, have a good one. Keep playing those games. Bye. Bye.